Yeah. Are all you guys seniors? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Altman Hall. I'm the professor here at the Transportation Research Center. And uh, it is always so thrilling when you get to introduce favorite students from the past. Um, and Dr. Kerry Watkins is, is one of those students from the University of Connecticut for me. And uh, it also makes you feel old when favorite <laughs> students from the past uh, are professors at uh, big engineering schools. And Carrie is also that. She is uh, an assistant professor at Georgia Tech. And uh, she has more connections to us uh, than that because she was a fellow grad student of uh, Brian Lee uh, when they were both at the University of Washington. That's where Carrie got her PhD, and uh, she's also done a lot of work in consulting. She's had a lot of interest uh, all through the years in sustainable transportation, been a leader in bringing technology uh, to sustainable transportation. And of course, she's going to talk to us today about real-time transit information, enablers, impacts, and implications, uh, but we're all also interested uh, about how she uses technology and apps um, for other modes as well. So uh, we'll talk about lots of modes. Uh, lots of behavior, lots of technology application, and it's just a thrill to have Carrie here to lead us in this discussion. Thank you for coming, Carrie. Thank you. Yeah, I'll go this way for sure. <laughs> All right. So, um, as Lisa said, uh, I did my PhD at the University of Washington. Apologies to Brian. If there are actually a few slides in here that are still left from the dissertation back in the day, but I believe because you graduated before me, you've maybe seen that you maybe didn't even see that part of the work. But this is really a compilation of lots of different studies that we've been doing over the past, gosh, eight years now, I think it is. Um, so credit goes to my first PhD student who graduated and is now a professor at City College, so I get to have that experience of going to introduce her one day, um, as well as a few master's students who worked with me on various studies that I'm going to talk about. Um, but in sum, what we're going to talk about is how these little devices that we're all carrying around with us today are sort of changing the world of transit. And I do research in that as well as research in using these for bikeability, things like that. But this is really about real-time information, which I'll, I'll get to what we mean by that in a second in case there's anyone in the room who doesn't know. So why is it that I work on transit? If you're a believer in sustainable transportation and trying to get us around in different ways, um, you, this is probably old school, but I'd like to start with an introduction to why it is that, that I believe that transit is actually making a difference in the world. Um, there are a lot of societal benefits from transit, the reduction in congestion, uh, reduction in gasoline consumption, emissions. It provides mobility to non-drivers. There are a lot of folks out there who either choose not to or don't even have the ability to drive, and they really rely on our public transportation system to get them around. Um, and then there's some evidence to show that transit can really help create more compact, sustainable communities. Um, the problem with all of this, this sounds great, right, on the, on the surface. Lots of people are advocates for everyone else to take transit, right? But for the customer themselves, when you start to think personally about the decision that this is a mode that I'm going to rely on in, on a day-to-day -day basis, you need it to be fast, comfortable, reliable. And these are not qualities that our public transportation system always has. Whether you're here in Burlington or in a really urban area like Atlanta, these are problems that are constantly occurring. In fact, um, reliability is one of the key issues with the transit system. And here's an example from Atlanta. I didn't have enough time to pull these kinds of statistics for the Chittenden County transit system. But um, this shows you sort of this target of 76% on-time performance. And they're not even always hitting it, right? And this is mostly due to the fact that there's a lot of congestion. Most buses run in regular traffic, so they're stuck in the same traffic that everyone else is. And um, they're, in addition to that, subject to 
loads where lots of people are trying to use it at one point in time, or you get a wheelchair that's trying to board. All of these different things happen on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a traffic accident and people are suddenly, there's extra congestion on the roadway. All of these issues are going to occur and the, yet the transit system is trying to run on time. They're trying to run to this set schedule and often that's difficult to do. And so there's a lot of different ways that we can overcome that, um, that unreliability as we might call it. Uh, but a lot of the traditional ways that we would do this, like providing dedicated right of way. So having lanes that are for buses only or building light rail and subway systems and things like that that run in their own right of way. That's a great way to do it, but it's very, very expensive to do that. And so there's only certain situations where we're ever gonna be able to afford that kind of infrastructure. There are other ways we can do it through service planning, like adding a lot of buffer to transit schedules. The problem with that is it becomes really expensive and, and then it makes it so that the transit system is not running as efficiently as it could. So there really is an inexpensive, what we call demand side approach to helping with this unreliability. And it's the, the, the ability instead of dealing with the unreliability is to just tell people about it. Just let them know, okay, there's something in the system that's wrong at this point in time. And so you need this information to go about your day. And so the main way that we've been doing this, a lot of folks have been doing this at this point, is providing information about at this particular stop that you're interested in, this is how many minutes until the next bus is actually coming. And there's a lot of other information that can go into that that I'm gonna talk about later, but at the simplest form, just having that power of knowing, okay, the schedule says this particular time, but the truth is that that bus is five minutes late right now. Or even that in one of these cases, it's two minutes early. So if you're right on time, you better know that so that you can rush out there. Because if this is a bus that's on a 30 minute headway, you're gonna have another 30 minutes to wait if you miss that one because the driver happened to be early that day and didn't realize it. So today I'm gonna to talk, as I said, um, about three things. And the first of those is enablers of real-time information. So how did we get to the point where we are today that we can have all of this information in the palm of our hands? So three things have occurred. The increasing use of automated vehicle location data for transit systems, the prevalence of mobile devices that we've got these all over the place, and open standardized data. So the first one I'm not going to go into too much detail. Uh, for those of you who are young enough that you don't remember the year 2000, we used to have selective availability of GPS signals. The government changed that in that year, and basically that was the beginning of us having a lot more of these AVL systems on transit systems. So we now had the ability to track transit really easily. We could track where the buses were going as well as many other applications of this. But in our industry, it became really important because you could do this at a much cheaper price than you could in the past. Um, the prevalence of mobile devices. So what we've watched happen, this is data from Pew. We've watched cell phones sort of gradually increase over time and more and more people owning cell phones. But smartphones were this amazing technology where when the first ones came out with our Blackberries and things like that, and then eventually the iPhone coming out, this was sort of this new idea that, wow, we can be connected at all times, not just to be able to talk to people, but to be able to get information. And that's been a really powerful thing with to the point where we now have almost 60% of the population um, in the latest Pew survey, which there should, I believe there was one that was actually done after this, um, and this trend is continuing, that we're getting to the point where 60% of the population has these types of devices. So it's really easy to get this information to people all over the place. We no longer need expensive signage at every single stop in order to be able to get information out there to know when transit vehicles are actually coming. The other enabler um, that I tend to spend a lot of time working on is open data. So what has also happened is that agencies have started to take this information. They've maybe equipped their transit fleets with AVL 
so that they can track their own fleet. But they hadn't been actually giving this information out to the public. And what's changed more recently is that they're now either setting up their own apps and, and giving information out to the public, or they're giving the data out so that developers can come in. It maybe is a national developer that has something like the transit app, something like that, and they want to be um, bringing as many transit agencies as possible into the, this particular app so that you could use it from one city to the next. Or maybe it's a local developer who is an avid transit rider and they're sick and tired of not knowing when the bus is coming and so they create their own app and they pull that data from their local transit agency. Well, what had happened in the past was that a lot of times this data existed with the agency and they were even willing to share it with developers but it took a lot of time because the developers would have to request that data on an individual basis. And so you maybe had one person who was interested, some sort of transit fan sitting in Atlanta, who said, oh, I'm going to request the data, I'm going to build this app, and I'm going to actually put it out there so that riders could use it. What's happened more recently, though, is we've got a lot more data standards. So things like the general transit feed spec that was developed between Google and TriMet in 2005. That type of thing has enabled it so that data is in the same format no matter which agency is putting it out there if they use this standardized format. And now websites exist where you can publish your data in these standardized formats so that everybody can get at it. And what that does is when the data is open like that and in these standardized formats, there's a lot more developers who will access that. Somebody sitting in Atlanta will say, well, you know, my brother is up in Burlington and he'd love to have this too, so I'll include Burlington in my same app, right? And that becomes a much easier process because they can just go to one place. It's very easy to bring that into something that they've already created, some app or tool that they've already created. And so you end up serving a lot more people with the same amount of code and the same amount of applications that are out there. So um, those were some of the enablers. And now this is how we've used it. I work with a project that's called One Bus Away. And what it is is a suite of tools that provides real-time information um, for passengers, and we do it via open source software. So not only are we using open data from all of these different transit agencies, but the software that we've coded sits on GitHub. People can access it so that they can deploy it in other places if they want to do so. We have an API that developers can use if they're trying to build tools on top of what we've established, and all of it is free to riders. Um, why do we do this? Well. We're looking to make it easier to use public transportation, but it's also a backbone for research. So what you're going to hear about most of the presentation is how we're actually using the platform of One Bus Away to study how having real-time information changes people's attitude about public transportation, usage of it, things like that. So One Bus Away has a website interface um, where you can see the different agencies that are actually on it. Um, and then we have mobile app interfaces. So there's an Android app, an iPhone app, and there's even a Windows app. The program was originally created in Seattle when I was at the University of Washington. So those Microsoft people couldn't let there not be a Windows phone version. Um, and all of these are maintained by independent developers. We've actually got a large community of developers who volunteer their time to work on these apps. So we get funding from various government sources to keep the program going. Uh, some of the transit agencies that are using it will fund various initiatives, either for their own area or for the national project. But a lot of what we do is just somebody who loves transit and so they get home from their day job at night and they'll code on one bus away for a few hours, which is a fantastic thing. So how to use one bus away, basically what happens is you get this start screen that gives you a map of all the stops that are close to you. Um, and then when you click on one of these stops, it'll list out what routes are are near are stopping at that stop and then it gives you information about how many minutes until it's coming what the route number is and whether it's early late or on time and it's color-coded according to which of those it is so you can 
see a bus that's late versus on time versus the red color for early because that's usually something we're really concerned about because um, it throws riders off than any of the rest of them. And there's a lot of other features in the apps that we have for One Bus Away. Um, it's location aware, so it is using the GPS in the phone and can actually pinpoint so you're getting the stops closest to you. Um, we have the ability to send out service alerts if the agency publishes those. I'll talk more about those later in the um, presentation. And then we also have the ability for people to report problems. So we've used this in instances like in Seattle, they transitioned to a new GPS system on the buses. Lots of people were getting weird errors in the data, so they would report that through the apps and we could forward that onto the transit agency so that they could pinpoint locations that needed to be fixed. Um, so this shows you the location aware ability and then we also have bookmarking, things like that. So at this point, these are pretty standard app type things. You may have seen a similar app to this in any number of cities that you've been to, DC, Chicago, Boston, places like that. Um, one of the unique things that we've done with One Bus Away is that um, Sean Barbeau at Cutter created um, an interface that allows us to add in new regions so that the region themselves can keep all of the back end stuff housed wherever they want and we just put a link to that within the app. And so um, we can add very easily on if a new deployment comes about, people can find that and it will automatically direct to that local server. So if you are, um, if you've got one bus away, you're using it in Atlanta, you travel to Seattle, it will automatically detect that you're now in Seattle and it will start pulling the data for the local transit agency. Um, so this is pretty similar to these apps that are nationally done, like the transit app and, and um, various ones like that. The difference is it's not us holding all of the data centrally within our organization, but it's anybody could put the data out there and be running their own instance of it and we're just linking to that instance. So that's all great, right? That's how we've enabled this to come about, that we've got great information in the palm of our hands. What's the impact of that? What does this actually do? Why does it matter that we've got real-time information so easily available to us now? Well, there's, there's three main things that we had sort of found while I was working on my dissertation, and we've confirmed over the past few years over and over again. Riders are more satisfied using transit, they feel safer, and they wait less time. And those were sort of our three big ones. But what we had questioned over and over again is, does this actually result in people taking more trips on transit? Does it actually make our transportation system more sustainable because we've got a mode shift towards transit? Is that possible? And that's sort of the big question that we're still trying to address. In order to talk about all of these different studies, it's important to talk about where one of one bus away is. The let's see if the pointer pro works. So that's, there we go. The original deployment was out in Seattle, Washington, where we started the project in 2008. Um, and then since I left the University of Washington and took a faculty position at Georgia Tech, we've started to make the program more national. We brought Cutter in to help on some of the coding end of things. We've brought some other independent developers in and encouraged them to work on it. And via that, um, there have been new deployments. So New York City was one of the first ones. Uh, bus time, New York MTA is in New York City's main application to get data out to developers for their various apps, um, is actually built on the platform of One Bus Away code. They had brought in some consultants that did enhancements and some changes to that, um, but the basis of the code is the same. And so the system there is running on one bus away. Um, and then in Tampa, Florida and Atlanta, Georgia, we launched newer deployments so that we could do research studies looking at what the impacts of this would be. But also because in both of those places there were not great sources for users to get information about when transit was arriving. Um, and so we were trying to fill a void there. 
Um, York, Ontario. Uh, actually, this says this month. This is an old slide. I should have fixed that. It's actually been launched for several months now. So if you happen to travel to York, you'll be using one bus away if you call up the, uh, the local transit information there. Um, and then DC, we had a deployment that was in testing, um, but certain things have happened that it looks like that one's not actually going to go to full production. Um, but we are open to other transit agencies that want to uh, give it a try as well. So, oh, what I meant to say is, so we did a lot of studies in Seattle when I was working on my dissertation and right immediately afterward. Once we did the deployments in Atlanta and Tampa, we wanted to study what, what those populations were like and some of the changes that were brought about there. Um, and then we wanted to, of course, do New York City, a place where the, the transit usage represents more than 50% of the usage in the United States of America. It's interesting always to do studies on whenever you have sort of new technology in the world of public transportation, you want to be testing what's going to happen in New York. So to give you some basics of what we found over all of these years of looking at this, um, change in satisfaction. I've always loved this quote um, from a user of One Bus Away saying, I no longer sit with pitted stomach wondering where is the bus. It's less st stressful simply knowing it's nine minutes away or whatever the case. So that's sort of indicative of the responses that we got um, from folks, in addition to things like marriage proposals and such, because they felt like this made such a big difference in their lives. We get great comments like, if I only had one app on my phone, this would be it, and stuff like that, which is great job satisfaction when you know you're making that kind of difference in people's lives. And speaking of satisfaction, um, what we found was that riders are a lot more satisfied with public transportation just as a result of having this information. So the transit system is no more reliable. Nothing else has changed. They just now know. They have some control back in their trip. And so um, we found that greater than 90% were either somewhat or much more satisfied just as a result of having real-time information. One of the interesting things as a female living in an urban environment and using transit a fair amount is how this actually um, impacts perception of safety. We actually found that it was the, the perception of safety was highly correlated with gender. So the women felt that if um, they had this kind of information in their pocket, in the palm of their hand, that they felt either somewhat or even much safer because they knew if it was an unusual situation, they could walk away because the bus wasn't coming and they could come back at exactly the right time so that they were trying to time that perfectly. So that feeling of safety can be a really big deal. And in addition, one of the bigger studies that I did um, for my dissertation was looking at wait times. So does having this information actually change your perception of how long you're standing there or how long you're actually standing there? Do you wait to go to the bus stop until just a couple of minutes before it's arriving because you know it happens to be late that day? And in a place where you've got other choices, if you happen to be in a downtown area, something like that, and you can grab a cup of coffee when it's five minutes late, then you may do that. You may not go and stand at that stop. In a place like Burlington, Vermont, where it's freezing cold in the middle of wintertime, maybe you want to stay somewhere warmer until you walk out to that stop. So having this information is going to change that wait time component of it. And what we found was this truly was occurring. Without real-time information, people actually perceived that they were waiting longer than they were. This is this amazing phenomenon, right, that you've probably noticed in a doctor's office or any sort of at the bank is the one that we always used to say, but nobody waits at banks anymore. So situations where you wait, you always think to yourself, oh my gosh, I've been here for 20 minutes. This is so long. And then you look down at your watch and you do the math and you realize, I've only been here for 10 minutes. This actually feels like about twice as long as I've been there. And this is typical in all waiting situations. We do lots of things to try to improve that. We put up mirrors, put in fish tanks, pipe in music. Mirrors are because we all love to look at ourselves apparently. And so time goes by much uh, more in line with how long it's going by if we can stare at ourselves while we're waiting. So in, in lieu of putting in mirrors at every bus stop in America, 
having real-time information actually because you know how long you've been waiting you tend to experience that the same as the time that's actually passing um, and we found that actually the value of real-time information in the regression models that we did was greater than having more frequent service so we would rather have a bus every 15 minutes but know when it's actually coming than have a bus every 10 minutes okay um, one of the things that we were looking for that we were actually surprised didn't occur, though, is we actually saw no change in the aggravation level. Um, and the only thing that I can surmise from this is the kinds of people who use real-time information a bunch and have these devices in their pocket and constantly want to know when things are coming and what's going on. Well, they have more of an aggravated level to start with, is my belief. <laughs> They're the type A personalities like me. Um, and so that could be what's playing out, but uh, we're not sure exactly. So then the big question is, all of this stuff is great, but does it actually increase our uses, usage of transit? Do we get more people taking public transportation as a result? And we did several um, stated preference studies. So we were asking people to self-report, do you take more trips when you have real-time information? And what we found was the greatest change was actually in the other trips. So there were lots of people who were maybe already commuters that were using transit to get back and forth to work, but they would now take it for that Saturday trip into the city um, to go out on a Friday night, um, to run errands, to go to a doctor's appointment, those non-peak commute trips. And the reason that that's a great thing is that is when our transit system is usually not full. Those are the trips when we can be actually pulling in more money from the fare box and we're not running any additional um, transit service in order to cover those trips. And so that's a really good way to make public transportation more sustainable. Um, but all of this was self-report data. So when I had my first PhD student start with me at Georgia Tech, the big question that I had been aching to ask was, all right, let's do some empirical studies where we can actually see, is this changing the number of trips that people take? Forget self-report, because it's not always as reliable. Let's actually study how many trips people are taking. And so we did three different studies, the first of which was in Tampa, because we had this new deployment starting. We got to do a unique study where we only gave uh, one bus away access to a certain group of people, and then we had a control group who was also in the study but didn't have real-time information. And we gave them all a free transit pass in order to participate in this study. Um, but the group that didn't have one bus away, we gave them the same before and after survey so that we could see if their trips were changing for some other reason that was going on in the system. And we could then compare that to the folks who had real-time information. Um, and that's basically what this says. What we found was that there were significant improvements in the waiting experience when people, we asked them how long they had been waiting um, both in self-report and then asking them questions about how long do you wait and then asking them again after they started using one bus away, how long do you feel like you wait on average versus this control group, there was actually an improvement amongst the one bus away folks and with the control group there was not. However, we found little evidence supporting a change in transit trips. Um, about one third of the real-time users, very similar to our Seattle study that we had done earlier, stated that they rode the, the bus more frequently, but when we looked at the number of trips, when we asked them how many trips do you take um, in the before situation and in the after situation, and then compared that to our control group, there was actually no change there. So there's a couple of reasons that this could be. It could be some sort of an affirmation bias. They knew they were doing this study for one bus away. They wanted us to get results that we wanted to get, so maybe they were saying they took more trips, Maybe they you know, were positive, they loved the app, they wanted to make sure that the agency was gonna keep the app, maybe consciously or unconsciously, they said they were taking more trips when really they weren't. Um, but it could also be partially the scale of measurement. 
the transit system in Tampa is very much used by transit dependent riders. So these are folks who don't really have a lot of discretion over the trips that they're taking on transit. If they need to go somewhere, that's how they're getting there. There's not a lot of choice riders in the Tampa system. And so um, there's maybe not a lot of room for there to be change taking place there. Um, and part of it was that we only had riders who were within the sphere of the transit agency. We recruited within the transit agency. So someone who was a completely new rider who heard about this from their friends, we wouldn't have caught them in a study like this. So it's interesting, but we wanted to try something else. So next came our beautiful econometric study in New York City. Um, the great situation here was that New York actually deployed one bus away on their transit fleet over time. So what happened was they initially did a pilot in February of 2011 in Brooklyn only on one particular line, the B63. Then from there, they did a launch on all of Staten Island. So you've got an entire borough that has real time online. After that, they did the Bronx, then Manhattan, and then finally Queens and Brooklyn. What this enabled us to do was to then compare from Staten Island to the other boroughs that didn't yet have real-time information, we've got our control there, right? And then as it came on, we can look at, okay, now the Bronx and Staten Island have real-time, but the other boroughs do not. And so we could do this sort of natural experiment that was occurring because they had a phased implementation of the technology. So we did this via panel regression techniques, and as I said, it was a well-suited natural experiment. And we did a couple of different models. In our single variable model, where we just said real-time information is present or it's not, we found an average increase of 115 rides per route per weekday, which is about 1.6%. There was actually a previous study done in Chicago that showed a very similar percent. So it's starting between the two studies to look like this is the kind of increase we can expect in a larger metro area. But one of the more interesting things that we did was we actually looked at it by route size as well. And the, the bulk of the increase was actually occurring on the routes that had the, lar the, the largest routes, as we call them. So the routes that were the most frequent. So if you had a route that was every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, that kind of frequency, real-time information made a big difference. It was like people were saying, okay, now I know when the transit service is coming and I can run out there and I can actually catch it and then I can rely on it. But were people gonna switch from whatever mode they were using previously to using transit instead if it was a route that came only every half an hour or only every hour? No. Because that's a big commitment, right? And if something changes in your schedule, you want to know that that transit service is there. So this sort of verified the idea that is real-time information enough all by itself? Well, no. You still have to have really frequent transit service in order for this to all work well and bring about the mode change that we're hoping to achieve. The last study that we did was in Atlanta. Um, where we had launched One Bus Away, but through our prompting, um, because we kept trying to get data from the agency and trying to get data from the agency, they actually even created their own apps and put those out there, and it's called Marta on the Go. So we don't actually have great One Bus Away usage in Atlanta, which for me is fine. Um, I'd actually rather see the transit agency jump in and be involved and create their own apps. I think that's fantastic that we motivated them enough to understand that this is important to give this kind of information out there. And then there are some other ones, such as the transit app, that have started using the Atlanta data feeds. So there's a number of different apps out there now in Atlanta. And what we did there was we did a survey um, in May of 2014, and we were trying to recruit both people who used real-time information and those who didn't. And what we did was we asked them in this survey, what their smart card number was. Atlanta is a unique situation that we actually had smart cards before we had real-time information. Often it's the other way around in various cities. 
So we could look back if they were willing to share their smart card number with us. We could look back and see how many trips they had taken over time. And we could see if that changed once that they had started using real-time information. So we could pinpoint that date and look at how the number of trips changed. So um, we had several people enter the, th the survey. Um, most of them gave us their smart card number. There were definitely a few in the sample who were not willing to participate in the survey once they realized they had to give us their smart card number, even though we assured them no one would ever use this number in any way. Um, and then in some cases, they gave us uh, a false smart card number either by typing it in wrong or purposefully because we did have a $5 Starbucks card that you got. So some folks managed to fool our system and get their Starbucks card even though we didn't get their smart card number. Um, so what did we find as a result of this? We asked people if using the app with real-time information changed the number of trips. Most of them said um, it didn't change the number of trips. A few said that they ride somewhat or much more often. We found that um, we asked them if it changes how long they wait, and we found that um, most people said that they spend somewhat less time, and a few spend much less time waiting. And then we asked them if they're more satisfied, and again, about 50% of the folks said that they're somewhat or much more satisfied. Um, but, and this is my summary slide, I should have had one more MARTA slide. One thing that we found though is with this method, there was little evidence to actually show that there was a change in the number of trips that people took. So when we used this smart card method and we matched the data up, we saw that the folks who had real time were not actually taking more trips. Um, part of that was that we were experimenting with this new method of combining smart card data and um, survey data. And so the whole processing of that, we lost quite a bit. Uh, by the end of it, we only had about 100 users in the study because we had to pull people out who had um, multiple smart cards um, or if they shared their smart card with somebody else. In a lot of these situations, you don't know that it's one card, one user, so we had to pull people out for that. There were a number of different circumstances that we were pulling people out. So we've, we've gotten smarter. If we did the study again, we would actually aim for a sample of more like two to 3,000 folks because you need that many before you can get a large enough sample size to actually test the difference as well. So what did we see? Well. In sum, in New York City, we saw that big change. We used a method where we could actually capture folks who were new riders as a result of real-time information, whereas the other two studies, it was mostly being advertised through the transit agencies, through people. With the MARTA study, you had to have had a smart card before and after using real-time, so you had to have at least been a sometimes rider. And in all of these, we were looking at very short time periods. So those are sort of my caveats to go along with it. So to answer that question, will it bring about more ridership? Well, if there's a lot of good things in place, it might, but it's still not going to be drastic numbers. But we still have those other results of more satisfied riders um, and changing that weight experience. So over time, with other improvements in transit, it could make a big difference. So that was enablers and impacts of providing real-time information. The last one to talk about is the implications of all of this. What does all of this mean? What are the things we should be worried about in, in providing all of this information? So a couple of different things to talk about. Um, one is putting information out there. These kinds of apps are great if you're already a transit rider, right? But if you're not encountering this app on a day-to-day -day basis to know what routes you could take and such, we're really not hitting that market of folks who maybe have never thought about using public transportation in order to get somewhere, right? Um, this is not, you know, they have to actually go and download the app in order to access it. So it's not sort of in-your-face kind of information. Um, the other thing to worry about is you saw that slide with the 60% smartphone penetration but that's 40% of the population that doesn't have these kinds of devices yet. So is providing information in this way an equitable thing to do, or should we be thinking about other things? 
And then is vehicle location enough? Are there other things that we should be adding into the data that people need in addition to knowing, you know, the next bus is coming in four minutes? Is there something else that they need to know in order to really use the transit system well? And then usability of apps is always something that we're worried about um, within, especially with the developers that I work with. So one thing to talk about when it comes to getting the information out there is the fact that, as I said, this device is in your pocket, but it's not going to challenge somebody who's been driving to work and is maybe amenable to using transit, but doesn't really know anything about the system. They've never really thought about it before. Are they going to start using transit as a result of this app that exists that they don't know about? Well, no, never. But one of the things that's starting to happen more and more, and we have a component in One Bus Away that does this, but there's also another firm out there that um, is doing, and I'm losing their name, Transit Screen, that is doing this in a number of different cities um, as well. And that is putting these signs that's pulling the same information that we're pulling in the apps out there. So we've got sort of a rough sign mode that we had been using in One Bus Away. Um, and it's really easy to actually put this in place. You can take a typical TV screen like this. You can plug in a Google Chromecast with it. If it's got power and internet access, you suddenly got a screen that's going to show you real-time information for the buses that are going by locally. So it can be put up in uh, office buildings, residential buildings, things like that. Um, coffee shops, places where you might want to have this information shown to people. And they may be, if they're seeing this on a day-to-day -day basis, would think to themselves, wow, I keep seeing this Route 12, Route 12, and it's got a name of some place that I might want to go. Maybe I should look into this and see if this is a way that I could get around. And so there are sexier versions of this coming about. The guys at Transit Screen have got beautiful displays that they do. Um, we had one of my students, Landon Reed, created a new display um, that can be used via One Bus Away uh, that is a really nice format so that people can see this displayed in these various buildings and interact with the data without necessarily knowing about the apps and things like that. So then moving to this idea of cell phone usage, I had a student who looked at if transit riders are similar to the general population. Pew gives us great information about um, how much of the percentage, how much of a percentage of the population is using cell phones and smartphones and has internet access. And they do all of these different studies about that. And they're really the go-to source in this area. But that's for the general population. Transit riders in many cities are much uh, are lower income in many cases, greater minority population in many cases. Um, and we wanted to see, OK, amongst transit riders, do you see these same sort of ownership rates? So she reached out to a number of agencies that had asked these types of questions on their surveys and actually found that most of them were pretty similar with both cell phone ownership and smartphone ownership. It was definitely tracking on the same line. And then we did a more detailed study with St. Louis Metro to see what devices do St. Louis Metro riders have access to if we were trying to fill in the gaps. So the main idea of the study with St. Louis was, OK, if the agency is putting their data out there, they're opening up their data, these developers are coming in, and they're developing these sexy apps or adding the information to these sexy apps. That's a great way to get the information. But what about you know, the grandma who is 70 years old, who uses transit on a daily basis? She is not going to have a smartphone in her pocket. She's not going to have access to these apps. How is she going to get this information? Um, and so we were trying to figure out, well, what technologies could fill in the gaps? So what we found was that um, Amongst both bus and rail riders, uh, it was a fairly small population who didn't have a cell phone at all. So if we could interact with folks via their cell phone, uh, rather than it being an app-based thing, but like some sort of an interactive voice response system, something like that, that would be a good way to reach most of the riders. Um, we, so we looked at um, over ages was one of the, the more interesting um, distinctions in terms of smartphone ownership, 81% of the folks in the study that we did owned a smartphone if they were 19 to 24, but
but if they were 65 or plus, we were down at 49%. Um, and then non-smartphones, but some sort of a, of a cell phone got us another 33% <laughs> to the point where amongst that population, we were only missing about 18% of the riders if there was some sort of interactive voice response system that they could be calling into instead of using an app. Um, so what we found in there was there was actually an inverse relationship between age and smartphone ownership. Uh, retired, unemployed, and homemakers were most likely not to have smartphones. There was a slight relationship between income and smartphone ownership. Um, but we actually found that uh, Caucasians had the lowest percent of smartphone ownership, and this is actually consistent with nationwide data amongst Pew and places like that. Um, in many cases, minority and lower income populations, they don't have an access to the internet, so this is the only way that they're going to get that. The problem is that they often own these devices but don't have consistent data plans. So unless we're going to do things like have uh, free Wi-Fi at a transit station or there's free Wi-Fi throughout a city, um, then they may still not have access to the data, even if they've got a device that they could be using to get it. Um, so then we looked at alternative technologies. What about text messaging? What about uh, voice response systems? Um, what if there was some sort of a website that they could access before their trip? And what we found was that the one that we had the best, um, best access would be having some sort of a call-in system still. The other part that we do is my colleague at the University of Washington, Alan Borning, who advised us on the original One Bus Away project, has an entire project called Stop Info, where they're trying to gather information about all of the bus stops in the area so that we can make it easier for people who are blind um, or wheelchair users in order to be able to access the information that they need to use the transit system because it's a higher level of information than just real time. There's no clock in this room. How am I doing on time? Order of. Okay. Um, so I'm almost there. So boy, that's okay. And then um, the last piece that I wanted to talk about was this idea of what other information should we be putting into the apps? Is just having real-time information enough? Um, the way that most transit agencies send out service alerts today to let you know if something is really unusual. So it's one thing to know, okay, the bus happens to be five minutes late um, on this particular route on this particular day. Um, but the truth is that it's going to keep saying that it's five minutes late for the next hour because it's broken down and it's sitting, you know, five minutes from you, right? It's going to get you in five minutes, but it's never going to actually get there because the GPS tells you that it's sitting there, but it's not actually moving. So that prediction, it's going to stay at that same prediction and you have no better information than that unless you've got some sort of a service alert component added into that. So the whole idea of service alerts is, Something temporary has gone wrong. A, a bus has broken down. There's very severe congestion because um, something has happened in the system, right? There's a, a road closure, a, a water main break that suddenly happened and all traffic is stopped. All of those kinds of situations. In Seattle, this was a really big deal because we would get snow every other year and it's a very hilly place and the whole city would shut down. Um, they, they really couldn't deal with this in, for many, many reasons. First of all, the hilliness. Second of all, they didn't have the equipment to deal with it. And third of all, they're so environmentalist out there that there was no way that they were going to salt and sand the roads. They said, eh, we'll just shut down the city for a week. That's fine. We can deal with that, right? Problem is that some people don't agree with that. Some people want to actually get to work. And the transit system is a great way to do so, but they would reroute the entire system to non-hilly roads so that it could still function. And exactly the time when you need real-time information the most is when it would fall apart because you didn't know that your same stop that you had always gone to was just down the hill. And if you walked just a couple of blocks down the hill, you could catch your bus that was running fine. That was when you needed information. And so what we did was we tried to add this kind of service alert information into One Bus Away. Um, the way that alerts are usually sent out today is that 
Often agencies have websites, they've got email accounts where you can sign up to get these email alerts if things are wrong, or they'll use their social media like Facebook and Twitter to send out these kinds of alerts, which is absolutely fascinating to me. Um, there's been a number of, uh, a number, there's been one big study that's been done, or two, that have been done looking at how negative the general opinion of transit agencies is among social media. Basically, we use social media to say how much we hate transit. This is like a big thing that we like to do. And I think that a reason for that is the fact that many of these agency accounts, what they're sending out is, this bus is out of service, this rail line is running late, and if all you see is this negative information over and over again, that's just gonna help that negative opinion of the fact that this agency doesn't know what they're doing, they can't run their service. But the truth is that 99% of their service is running fine, but you only hear about the ones that aren't. So in my opinion, social media is the worst way to do this. Um, what we wanna do is be informing riders about these kinds of alerts, real time and individually. So we want to be sending it out via an app like this, that if I look up a particular stop, then I get something oops, like this little danger symbol telling me, okay, the 44, maybe it says that it's X minutes late, but that's not a real reliable prediction because that bus is broken down, right? But I'm only going to see that if that happens to be the one that I care about. So instead of sending this alert out to 10,000 people, you're sending it out to the 10 who actually need to see that alert. Um, and so we put the functionality in there to accept all of these different alerts. And there are other apps that are starting to go in this direction now as well. And then finally, um, one of the things we're working on right now is sort of revamping the apps to make them more usable. Um, there's been some great additions to the transit scene recently, and so we're going to mimic some of the things that we've seen on theirs, as well as doing some user studies and, and things like that. So what does this mean for Vermont? I had to do my homework last night to check out a few things to maybe personalize this a little bit for you guys. Um, how many of the folks, if you don't mind telling me, in the room are at least sometimes transit users on your local bus? Okay, quite a few of you. Good. So one of the things um, that is really key in services like in places like Burlington is this idea that if you have to run less frequent service because you don't have a huge population using transit, that's when real time becomes even more important. Because if your bus is every half an hour, you don't want to be missing that service. You need that data in the palm of your hand. You don't want to be waiting. You don't want to have an early bus come and you miss it, and you have to wait that long. Um, one of the problems, though, is it's harder to get developers involved. So if you don't have this huge local development community, like in Boston or Atlanta or San Francisco, you're not going to have people who are coding these kinds of applications on their own. So for that reason, open data is even more important because you're not necessarily going to have somebody who's going to seek out the agency to help create these tools or put pressure on them to help create these tools. Um, and so I did a quick check last night of um, the open data status, not for real-time information, but for scheduled data at least. So can you get the schedules via um, is the data out there so that someone could actually add the schedules to various apps? And I didn't have time to look, so maybe you guys can tell me if some of these apps, like the Transit app or things like that, exist in this area so that you get this information. But what I was able to find was that Chittington County didn't actually have their data opened up and on um, some of these sources where you can get this data so that developers can add it to various apps. So you guys can put some pressure on there if you would like to. Um, and then Connecticut River also didn't, and the other agencies I could find though, Addison County, Advanced Transit, and Rural Community. Hopefully you guys know where I'm talking about with these. These are, to me, this doesn't really mean much, <laughs> but uh, these were the ones that were listed in Vermont that actually had opened up their data and put it um, on the various websites so that it, um, developers could access the information and add them to different applications that they were doing. Um, so there you go, there's your local information. So in sum, our enablers for real time were increasing use of AVL, uh, the prevalence of these devices all over the place in our pockets and whatnot, 
um, the existence of open data so that agencies are putting that data out there to get developers interested. What has happened as a result of the fact that we have this information out there is people are more satisfied, they wait less, and where frequent service exists, we've actually increased ridership. Um, and the implications are that we need to make sure that everybody can access this kind of data. Maybe it's via putting signs in strategic places. Maybe it's via having some sort of a call-in. Um, we need to make sure we're getting all the data people need, service alerts, and giving feedback. Um, and I think there really is a future in all of this. If you look, some of the newer apps are doing things like linking in Uber and things like that. So if you do miss your bus, you can press a button. And if you're willing to spend three times as much that particular day because you really want to get somewhere, you can call for an Uber to come and get you instead. We're sort of looking at this transportation system that's really changing to involve all of this different data um, so that we can be more mobile without actually owning a vehicle uh, that is always with us. So with that, lots of references. I'm going to leave the presentation so you guys can look up some of the papers if you're interested. Um, and here is my contact information. And I would love to take questions if we have enough time. I was not too long. Um, can you talk about any challenges or lessons learned in working with GTFS data? Um, sure. Uh, it's Difficult, several. Karen, maybe tell other people. What is GTFS data? So GTFS data is general transit feed spec. It used to be called the Google transit feed spec because it was started with Google. Um, the initial agency they worked with was TriMet in Portland. Um, they had Google um, as a trip planner on the automobile side of things out there, and they wanted to add a transit component. And so they were trying to pull in all these different agency schedules, and so they created this standardized data format to make it easier on them. The result is that tons of agencies have now gotten their information into this standardized data format. It's not real-time information. There is a GTFS real-time in addition, but the bulk of it is all scheduled data. Uh, there are tons of things that you can do with this because you've now got the scheduled data in one format. I had a student who looked at um, comparing, you know, agency versus agency. Can re we replace sources like the National Transit Database because we've now got all of this data that's in this standardized format for all of these agencies. Um, so that said, that's your explanation of what GTFS is. A um, couple of things. In working with GTFS, one of the hardest things for us as developers is when agencies don't use the time portions of it, right? Like the metadata piece of it, the same frustrations if you work in like GIS data and such. Like if people don't do metadata, you're like, this is great. I've got a data set. How old is this data? How accurate is this data? Um, the same thing happens with GTFS that an agency will be like, oh, we opened up our data and they leave it out there and then they change their schedule three months later and you have no idea that you're sending this data out there that's incorrect. Um, so sort of keeping up with the developer community and letting them know when updates are happening or even if they regularly do updates, put an end timeline on that data that says, you know, this is for the schedule that ends in March um, and then make sure even putting that GTFS feed out a couple of days early to give the developers a chance to actually get it into the various apps. We often have the case with Marta where, you know, we're lucky if we get an email the day of when they're actually, you know, starting this new schedule. And so we're scrambling. I've got my student who works on the project working at like 1 a.m. so he can, you know, and it takes him a half an hour to get a feed in, right? This is not a big deal, but we're trying to get it in place before that morning commute. Um, so that would be one of the biggest challenges on our end. Um, creating the GTFS the first time because it's graphical, it's, there, there's a GIS component to it. Um, is difficult for some agencies because oftentimes they don't even know, have exact locations for their bus stops. Like they can tell you that it's at the corner of Front and Main, but there is no actual point for that. And so it's difficult for them to create it so that we have the ability to actually bring it into the apps. So a lot of times um, agencies will hire some of these smaller developer firms um, 
to actually help them get it in that the first time at least, um, and then maybe even maintain it over time. Does that help? Yeah. Other questions? Uh, what are the financial incentives for the app developers? Um, how do they make money? Good question. Um, a lot of them don't. Um, a lot of them do this because they're passionate about it, and so they're not really concerned with making money. Uh, some of the ones that I've worked with, they use this sort of as a test project because we've got a large enough community around it that they can learn from some of the other people doing it, um, and so they play around with it. Um, some of the apps that are out there, though, they charge for you to download them. So if you've got enough people doing it, and that's why they're usually looking towards bigger cities, right? So you might not see you know, some of these agencies. I can't even remember. You might not see that everyone's real keen to make sure that advanced transit has, you know, is in the transit app because there's not going to be so many people um, downloading the app just so that they can get that data. So a lot of times these smaller agencies don't necessarily get added in. Um, so there's not, it's not like there's a ton of money to be made in this realm yet, although the guys at Transit Screen are doing great in terms of bringing in um, investors and such. So I think this idea of putting these screens up in, in more urban environments, at least, is sort of taking off. And there may be the ability to make some money there. There's no government funding. There is. I, I mean, I've been able to fund my research pretty well. Um, so via U, UTCs, um, we have a couple of different university transportation centers at um, Georgia Tech. Uh, they have one at Cutter, and that's how Sean's been able to fund himself. Um, we've gotten NSF funding in the past. Alan Borning has. Uh, so we do a lot of the development pieces and sort of the big jumps when we get these kinds of grants. Um, but in terms of having money for the smaller developers to work on the projects, it's hard to fund them because you have to be a part of the UTC to work on this. You can somewhat hire outside developers, but it's hard to sustain that. It's usually in little pockets. Yeah. Um, I work for CCTA. Okay. Um, where were you looking for the GPFS cable? So I went, uh-oh, see? I made an accusation. He's like, that's not true. <laughs> Our data is open. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I did, I'm trying to think with the, I went to um, the GTFS data exchange. That's one of the big ones. I can get you, if you want to leave your information, I can get you, there's several different websites where people will just post the link um, to it. Is it on your own website, we, but we not on? From the legacy perspective, we just throw it in a zip file on our website. Okay. And probably nobody knows who's there, so right. they ask us. And then we also uh, send it off to VTrans, which okay. is the states. Right. But you know, who knows what, what the intent is? That's more for government use and that kind of thing. Right. Um, and then we publish it to Google directly, so it's integrated to Google Transit. Right. But and then occasionally. But Google does not share that with anyone else. Okay. So that, it's only good. going to Google when you do that. It's really good to understand. But yeah. I mean, we've been approached by Apple and stuff like that, but we're really in a weird way. We're still we still haven't found a good place to publish an aggregate, and as a Someone who's involved in publishing in general, I hate that we have to do it so many different ways. Yeah. So GTFS Data Exchange is the big one that I know of that most um, agencies are sending it to to make sure that it's like the larger developer community knows that it's out there. Um, but I will double check for you to see if there's other ones other than that. And it's pretty easy to upload the data to that. So, super. Other questions? I have a nitty gritty uh, question about your. Um, there, I, I think you did more than one studies like this, but the New York study, for example, was looking at travel behavior over time. Right. And so with the phase in at, um, in different uh, boroughs. Each borough, uh huh. How did you uh, control for external factors like changes in gas prices or other motivators that will have an impact on behavior. Yeah, so in two different ways. One is that we actually included a lot of that in the regression model. So um, gas prices was one of them, which actually, I'm trying to remember the whole model now. I've got slides on it, so I can show you later if you want to see. But um, uh, gas prices, I think, was not actually significant. And that's because 
we had the other boroughs as the control. Mm -hmm. um, but there were a few things like uh, the introduction of the bike share, um, city bike was a really big deal and was sort of throwing us off for a while. So we, we put an indicator in there for that. We're still not entirely sure that it worked exactly the way we wanted it to because it actually showed that it took way too many people away from transit um, mm -hmm. to start using the city bike system. And it was sort of like at an unbelievable rate. We were like, really, is it is it killing transit that bad in Manhattan? Um, and maybe this is taking place. Candy is now there and so this is one of the first studies that she actually wants to look at is the relationship between bike share and transit usage um so we'll see but we had several other indicators like that uh, new york has great data so it was pretty easy to include a lot of those types of things in our regression model so one more question i saw from the window yeah. so i'm wondering about your experience with the ADL data and, and agencies, we've got some experience with agencies getting into agreements with vendors that they then can't get access to their own Yeah, data. yeah. So th this is a huge problem. Um, there are a couple of different problems that we've faced over my history of doing this. Uh, one of the biggest ones was actually for a while we had a patent troll that was saying that uh, real-time information was subject to this patent. So you have these smaller developers who um, you know, really couldn't be doing this because they couldn't afford to buy access to the patent. Uh, that has since been taken care of by APTA, that they found previous art that showed that um, real-time information in transit had existed before these patents. And so um, that's sort of not a big issue anymore. Um, then the other one in working with the AVL data, a lot of times, the agencies want to just buy this black box system so they don't have to worry about it. But then later, when you want to have access to that data, the, the folks who've sold you this black box system are like, no, no, it's our data. We put it in place for you. And they don't have the ability to open it up. Um, what's happened since then is a lot of agencies are writing into their initial contracts now that they know this. They're saying, OK, this is great. We'll pay your high price tag to get all of this to work. But we want this data in the end. And it has to be ours. And we have to be able to share with other folks. And the, you know, I think there was some hesitation on the part of the companies that are providing ABL systems and whatnot um, in the beginning. But I think eventually they sort of come, came around to the idea of, you know, we're going to no longer have clients if we aren't willing to play in this open game. And then some of them really believe in it as well. Um, and then the last thing that's sort of happening is agencies like New York putting it together in this piecemeal fashion um, so that they don't have to rely on you know this vendor that's going to come in and give them the whole system at once they're like we're going to gps equip our own buses we're going to you know use an open source platform in order to put the data out there we're going to rely on independent developers to add it to their apps but they're new york city so i mean they can get away with this stuff i think it's harder i mean you can speak on behalf of chittenden county but you know you probably don't have a lot of technology folks in the house who have the ability to GPS equip your own buses, right? So, um, you know, whether that's going to work long term or not, we actually applied for an NSF grant to try to help agencies make it so that this can be done incrementally um, to kind of push the, the industry along. So we'll see if we get that. Right, because I, think, I suspect that the vendors are able to offer them equipment at lower rates right. because they know they're going to own and use Exactly. So it's, it's a tough competition. Yeah. yeah. So um, a couple of things. I noticed Glenn is just passing around the sign-up sheet from Zach. So let's stand up and stretch, but make sure you sign in for Glenn. Um, many of you need to, to move on to your next activity. Some of us are staying for a sort of a technical roundtable discussion with Carrie. So let's all take a five-minute break. Um, those of us who are reconvening, reconvene at 11.15. And uh, thank you very much to Carrie Walsh. Thank you. We're a little late in this, but if people before they leave can just uh, sign I, in. I asked so. I said when we should do this. Yeah.
Stop it from streaming. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>